We are now at the last presentation of our session, and we conclude with the private investor's perspective. The speaker is Anne McIvor. Uh, Mrs. McIvor developed her background on economics and finance at Queen's University in Belfast and at the London School of Economics. After working as an investment analyst at several firms in London, Mrs. McIvor developed her own business, founding in 2006, Cleantech Investor. Cleantech Investor is a publisher of finance, investment, and business information, focusing on the whole cleantech sector. <laughs> Since last July, Anne McIvor is also managing director of CrowdTech Funders, a new crowdfunding company focused on larger deals in the technology sector. So, Anne, you are very well plus, placed for sharing with us the private investor's perspective, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Flavio, for the introduction. Um, oh, there's my slides. Um, I, I noticed that the ladies were on last. I think is this a gender issue, but we're, we're certainly going to make a noise here. I think our presentations are going to have an impact. So, um, <laughs> sorry, gentlemen. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, talk, I'm not an investor, but I have represented investors, and I've, I've, I know a lot of investors, so um, uh, I'm talking about the investor's perspective on um, energy today. And um, I want to start with talking about who investors are. And so, so I was, first of all, who finances the low-carbon energy transition? Well, we know about national governments, you all know about grants and subsidies, you know about the EU uh, equity funding, grant funding for, for R&D and technology. Um, but it's also, where does that money come from? I, I didn't try to do the whizzy thing where, you, where we add the last bit, so I've, I've, you all know what I'm gonna say, it's you and me. It's our taxes who fund this energy transition ultimately um, in terms of, of the money that's coming from the national governments and from the EU. And, and, and we pay for it not just in taxes, but potentially also in higher energy bills. Um, who finances the low carbon energy? Well, secondly, we've got industry, and we've already had a, an industry representative speaking about the implications, especially for energy intensive industries. And, and I would say that the, the profits of those energy intensive industries, the chemical industry is making less money in some instances because it's got to comply with carbon trading, for example, and other regulations. Uh, and that profit effectively is an investment um, because that profit could otherwise have been used to invest in something. So um, taking an investor perspective, uh, the, the industry is also um, part of the investor community, as are el el energy utilities for the same reason. Banks provide loans. We all know about banks. Banks typically provide loans rather than, um, than equity, although there are, of course, investment banks, which also provide equity. And um, what people typically think of as investors is people who provide equity investment in energy, product, in energy projects and in energy technologies. And so who are these investors? Well, there are a lot of very different types of people. And I think that, that sometimes there's a tendency to assume that, that investors are all one great big ass, or class of people and, and, and they've got um, sort of like civil society. Uh, I don't represent investors as Marianne didn't represent the people, but how do we, you know, effectively it's all of us. Um, so the institutions who manage your, the, the fund managers who manage your pension fund, um, your insurance policies, all of those people are, are investors. Um, and, and so, uh, well, the, the, the big long list is there. I can go into it in more detail, but I think we're short on time. But uh, just to make my point, investors want profit. Why do they want profit? They want profit because they have to manage the risk, and that is the risk of your money. That's your pension, your children's schooling. It might be, you know, whatever it is. Um, all of those, those, those issues are basically something that, that, that leads investors to want to manage their risk. And, and uh, so, so I think it's very easy to sit back and say, well, these investors, why aren't they putting more money into these new technologies and new innovations? Well, you've got to remember that they have a responsibility to you personally and to me, and, and we don't want them to, to take an irresponsible risk. And so, you know, we, we've got to bear that in mind, I think. So that's a bit of a backdrop. Um, 
Uh, sorry, <laughs> if I can, I'll come, coming on now to, to work, well, actually just moving back one because there's one, the second on the list there, venture capitalists, um, to a degree that there's a lot of people complaining that they're no longer taking the risk for early stage technologies and no longer venturing, especially within clean tech. Um, and uh, most, of, most people have seen this present or the, the, this diagram before, I, I would expect, but, but if you're not from an investment community, maybe you haven't. Um, it's especially relevant to clean tech, but the valley of death is a, a phenomenon in, in technology investment generally. So, so getting the government funding, getting your basic scientific research proven and tested, that's the first stage and that's, that's where a lot of companies come get to with, I, I wouldn't say Horizon 2020, but maybe some of the predecessor programs and, and national programs for grant funding. But uh, then they've got to get the private sector funding and they've got to get that first product demonstrated and scaled up to a point where the investors, the people we talked about earlier, who don't want to take risks, until they get to that, that, that stage of, that they've, they've demonstrated the product and scaled it up, most investors just don't want to know. And uh, this is the dilemma, I think, that we're all sort of here, here to talk about, um, amongst all the other issues. But, but in, in terms of the investment issue, I think this is one of the key issues. And it doesn't just apply to innovative technologies. Um, this is um, a not very clear, apologies for that. Um, it's a risk-reward balance, not very clear slide. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, but, but renewable energy projects, I think you can see that, that there is a similar issue here, that this very early development stage of projects um, is, a, is a problematic area where it's, it's a very high risk area f for anyone to invest in simply because there might not be planning permission. If you want to build a solar farm, if you want to build a wind farm, um, taking the easy examples, you've got to get the planning permission and until you've got the planning permission, you're not going to get bank finance, you're not going to get uh, any of the other types of institutional investment from those pension funds uh, and, and insurance companies who are risk of ours. Uh, so so th th those, those insurance companies and pension funds will, will accept that the, the return on, on their investment might be less if they don't get in until the later stage, but they avoid the risk of losing all the money altogether, which they can't afford to do if they're managing your money. So um, apologies for, for the sort of indecipherability of that slide, but hopefully you can get, get the point. It says the risk reward balance is what's been cut off there. Um, I'm, I, I thought I'd show some case studies of, of where you've had different types of government support in other, uh, in other areas. So just starting with the US government, uh, the Tesla Motors, everyone I think knows about Tesla. I, I can't believe I'm standing up here in Rome talking about the fact that Tesla is now valued at $27 billion compared to Fiat Chrysler, which is valued at $15 billion. Um, it's an example of a success story, and I'm not suggesting that the success was purely because of U.S. government loans, but they did get a lot of U.S. government loans, and uh, it was part of the whole Green, Green New Deal after the economic crisis, and, and uh, effectively Tesla Motors is, you know, the, the success of Tesla in Norway, where, where there's a great, I think it's one of the, the best-selling cars, for example, it, uh, and the Norwegian Electric Car Society, which was mentioned earlier, or the ele the civil society which is developed in Norway is based around Tesla to some degree, I guess. So it's a great success story. But equally, uh, US government loans have, have resulted in major failures. And uh, Solyndra was an example of a, a solar technology which was rendered obsolete by Chinese innovation. And I'm not saying, suggesting that the technology, the, the, the technology that became, that overtook Solyndra was Chinese. It was actually European technology, but the innovation was that the Chinese built great big factories to take down the price of PV to make uh, solar thermal, which was, the, or the Solyndra version of it, let's say, um, no longer commercially viable. And there are lots of other issues in between, and it's not a case of solar being a failure because actually, uh, and, and electric cars being a success because there were, there were also failures in um, electric cars in the US as well. So, so Fisker got a lot of money from the US government as well, but still, uh, it, and it went bankrupt too. But Solyndra was the, was the big problem. And um, there's something cut off the bottom of that slide as well, which I think actually said uh, that the US, or, or, or part of the problem, or one of, one of the, the sort of fallouts of Solyndra was uh, a reluctance among Silicon Valley investors and venture capitalists to be involved in, in um, technology investment anymore. So uh, 
successes and failures from US uh, policies. I'm, I'm now going to just use another case study, which is uh, Brazilian investment in, um, in wind power. Uh, BNDS, which is the National Development Bank in Brazil, is uh, uh, has a well. It, it, it provides loans at a discounted rate for project developers. Uh, so it, there's been sort of a lot of discussion about national champions, and uh, there's been a in Canada has been in, in discussions with or in, in debate with the WTO about about creating national champions. Uh, in, in the renewable energy industry. But the way that they do it in Brazil is that BNDS provides the loans uh, to, at a discounted rate uh, to anyone who wins in the auction. They have an auction system in, in Brazil which offers a 30-year a um, guarantee of, that, that you can supply electricity for 30 years, a PPA for 30 years to, to uh, the government. So you just auction and it's reverse. You, you enter the auction and the lowest price wins uh, they're in a reverse auction. And um, you only get the loans at the discounted rate from BNDS if you buy equipment which is manufactured in Brazil. Uh, now what, what has happened is that Vestas, Gamesa, Siemens, GE, all the major wind turbine manufacturers went up, went to Brazil and set up factories there. And Brazil all of a sudden has a manufacturing industry in wind. It doesn't have much of its own technology, it has some, but not much of its own domestic technology, but it's created a manufacturing industry. And that can potentially export. So that, that's just another way that other nations have done it. Uh, they're doing the same thing in solar and they, they recently held their first dedicated solar auctions which resulted quite quickly in uh, Sun Edison, one of the big US solar manufacturers, setting up a fact or announcing that it would set up a factory in Brazil to enable the winners of the auction to buy equipment from, from them. So um, just another food for thought, um, which brings me, I think, to my final point, but I think it's missing because the bit at the bottom is no longer there. But um, I, uh, <laughs> I'll have to remember what I was going to say now. So, um, my, the, my conclusions and my thoughts are that uh, energy policy and innovation are things that you can look at together. Innovation and manufacturing are things that you can look at together. And manufacturing and energy policy are things that you can look at together. But that it's very difficult from an investment perspective to look at all three at once. So uh, good energy policy um, and sta stable energy policy with long-term visibility uh, helps to de-risk investment. So investors know that there's going to be a feed-in tariff. They know there's going to be um, some sort of a, a incentive for them to invest on a long-term basis that can de-risk investment in new technologies, and that in itself can help promote innovation. Innovation and manufacturing go together. Obviously, there's going to be grant and 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 uh, funding for for from equity funding from governments, which can then underpin private sector investment and innovation. And manufacturing and energy policy can also go together. Oh, I'm being told that I'm I'm at the end of my time, and I can't remember what I was going to say because it's underneath there. I think it was basically that government and EU loan funding can underpin um, manufacturing within a region as they have done in Brazil, so that was my Brazilian point, uh, so they can help promote energy uh, uptake in terms of renewable energy. But my belief is that when you put the three together, it's confusing for investors because you've got different types of investors investing in different things. So you've got your, your innovation um, technology investors, venture capitalists, these types of guys. Then you've got the, the really risk averse investors who want to invest in in, in energy projects, and so it's difficult um, for them to, to be able to, to sort of, or, or for any policy, I believe, to, to capture all types of investors. So investors need to be considered as different types of, of entities and, and, and different policies need to think which types of investors are we targeting here. Um, and my conclusions, yeah, don't expect investors to take on reasonable risks. Uh, they might be responsible for your pension, and there are lots of different classes of investors, categories of investors, uh, you can de-risk investment, but you cannot necessarily um, promote, you can promote innovation, but which technology prevails is ultimately beyond the control of government because uh, you just don't know where the technology is going to come from. It might come from outside the EU. So I guess that's my conclusion. Thank you.